How's everyone doing today? Oh, y'all sound tired. How you doing? Woo! Yo, welcome to the Regeneration Summit, a celebration of black cinema. Repeat after me. When I say black, you say cinema, black. Black. When I say black, you say history, black. Black. Real quick, real quick. I need, I need you to do something for me, all right? I need you to tap to the beat like this. Uh, uh, uh. Repeat after me. Say, we rocks the party that rocks the party. Come on. Say, we rocks the party that rocks the party. Ha. Huh. Say, rocking the system that oppress me. Say, we rocks the party that rocks the party. Rocking the future that we all dream. Clap it up, y'all. This is the Regeneration Summit, a celebration of black cinema. My name is Anwar Latil Watkins. I am a public programmer here at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. Give it up for black history, y'all. So listen, this panel is unlike any panel that you have or will experience today at our Saturday Symposium. It is called Regeneration Cipher, Activism in Film. Say, ooh, let me see your spirit finger. Yeah. So for this panel, it is inspired by a hip hop cipher. But instead of us bringing out lyricists, we're gonna bring you influencers, leading activists, community leaders, and screenwriters to be in conversation with one another. And we're also gonna, we're gonna sprinkle in a spoken word artist to offer their own interpretation of the conversation, but using their medium. Sounds cool? All right, so let me introduce our panelists and let them come on out, okay? Bear with me, we got amazing dynamic panelists. So let me go through their bios real quick. First up, we have Justice Maya Singleton, clap it up. Justice Miles Singleton is a black trans screenwriter, director, poet, and stand-up comedian. Working in television and film, Justice noticed the artistic disparities between storytellers and gatekeepers. Inspired by his spiritual faith, Justice created a meditative writer's program called Justify Writer's Room. The writer's workshops enlist BIPOC creators to build community, and dismantle writer's block and systemic storytelling. Give it up for Justice Miles Singleton, y'all. We also have coming to the stage, Roger Ginver Smith. Adapt, thank you, thank you. Roger Ginver Smith adapted his Obie award-winning solo performance of a Huey P. Newton story into a Peabody award-winning telefilm currently streaming on Hulu. His Bessie award-winning Rodney King is on Netflix. Both were directed for the screen by Mr. Smith's longtime colleague, Spike Lee. Mr. Give it up, you, you, got, you got it. Mr. Smith and Mr. Lee were honored at the Cannes Film Festival for their three decades of distinguished collaboration. He is currently featured as an unsung radical physician, Dr. T.R.M. Howard and Chinonye Chukwu's Till. Give it up. Coming to the stage, we also have Jenea Future Khan. Clap it up for Jenea, y'all. Jenea is a black non-binary activist, storyteller, and the former international ambassador for Black Lives Matter. An accomplished lecturer and author, Khan has spoken to a vast array of college audiences, including Cornell, Duke, Smith, and University of Toronto. Khan's work has been featured across a variety of outlets, including Vogue, CNN, Time, ID, and Al Jazeera. They were also they were also Ad Week's Social Justice Creator of the Year for 2021. Give it up for Janae, y'all. Oh, last piece, my apologies. Khan's debut memoir, If the Sky Should Fall, will be out in January 2024. We also have Kyle Bowser, y'all. Kyle Bowser. Oh my gosh, y'all gonna just leave Kyle Bowser hanging? Kyle, ba Kyle Bowser serves as the senior vice president of the NAACP Hollywood Bureau. In this capacity, Mr. Bowser is responsible for advancing NAACP's Hollywood projects, relationships, and overseeing NAACP's Image Awards production. 
For nearly three decades, Kyle Bowser has worked as an entertainment industry executive. His experience spans film, television, music, theater, radio, and digital media. Give it up one more time, y'all. <laughs> Woo! Last but not least, y'all, we have Maya S. Cade. Maya S. Cade, give it up. <laughs> yes! Don't lose the energy. Maya S. Cade is the creator and curator of Black Film Archive, a first of its kind digital archive likened to be the definitive history of black cinema by Slate.com and a scholar in residence at the Library of Congress. Kate is the only person in history to win multiple esteemed special critic awards in the same season, receiving special distinctions by the New York Film Critics Circle, the National Society of Film Critics, and the Alliance of Women Film Journalists. In the years since Black Film Archive's 2021 launch, Cade's achievement has been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Hollywood P Reporter, and NPR later this month. She will present her guest film curation at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. Give it up. Are y'all ready for this cypher, y'all? Let's bring out our panelists. Let's go. Hi. All right. <laughs> How's everyone doing? <laughs> okay, so I would like to start where Regeneration Exhibition ends, 1971. Before black exploitation came into full swing, there were films like Melvin Van Peebles Radical Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, Black Chariot, and Madeline Anderson's I Am Somebody that used film as a tool to make sense of the kaleidoscope, kaleidoscopic visions of the civil rights movement. I'd love to open by asking the panelists, what should the audience know about the civil rights movement, roughly 1951 to 1968 on film? You, <laughs> you, you framed the question by identifying a start and end date. Um, and I don't mean to, to skirt the question, but whenever possible, I try to remind people that the civil rights movement began in 1619 and continues to today. Okay. However, um, if you look at a, a specific window of time and ask, okay, well, what was happening in the film movement during that window and what impact did it have on the movement? Um, those years that you mentioned coincided with a real sense of self-awareness in the black community, um, an embrace of our African roots, which prior to that window of time um, were often in debate in the community. To what extent are we African? To what extent are we something other? Um, <clears throat> but during that, part, that period of time, there was more of an embrace. We heard it in the music, we saw it in our style and f fashion, um, even the cuisine and the way we spoke with each other. Everybody was walking around speaking Swahili. Um, <laughs> and so filmmakers, I think, took a cue from that and started to show um, more of our indigenous selves in the stories that they told. Not that they had to be stories that, that were generated on the continent of Africa, but there was an Afrocentrism in the way in which they told even the African American story. Thank you. <laughs> I wanna continue with asking Kyle a question. Uh -oh. <laughs> Civil rights demonstrators are embedded in black history and how we discuss black film. The lesions of black demonstrators who protested the birth of a nation in 19, 1915 comes to mind. Kyle, as a senior vice president of NAACP's Hollywood Bureau, mm -hmm. can you discuss the critical role black activists have played in shaping black film? Wow, that's a big question. Um, you referenced uh, Birth of a Nation, which was, for those who don't know, was released in 1915, directed by D.W. Griffith, uh, based on a novel called The Klansman. Uh, the story takes place in the Reconstruction South 
that era. And um, the film it continues to be lauded for its technical achievement. Uh, some of the production values and techniques that were used by Griffith in the making of that film are actually still being used to this day. The storytelling sucks. Uh, but more importantly than the deliberate effort to demean and, and to cast black people as inhumane in that film, I think it's important that we recognize that the film coincided with the birth of this industry. Um, and I think it's important that we recognize that our industry doesn't respond to what's happening in, in the world and society, but it really is an extension of what's happening. It is part and parcel. Um, and so our industry has continued to uh, cast the African-American experience as an otherized lifestyle or, or people. Um, and, and Griffith kind of got the party started. I think you asked specifically about the protests. Um, the NAACP fought valiantly to have that film uh, banned from cinemas. Uh, we were unsuccessful in that effort. One of the things that led to um, our failure was the fact that President Woodrow Wilson decided to make it the first film ever screened inside the White House. Uh, it's important to note that as a result of that film, and I'm, I'm drawing, a, drawing a direct correlation after its release, there was a precipitous rise in the ranks of the Ku Klux Klan, and not just in southern states, in the Midwest. Uh, and there was also a huge spike in the number of lynchings. And so there is this direct relationship between storytelling, filmmaking, and, and the behaviors and the perceptions that follow. Thank you. Roger, I would love to take a moment for you to respond to this as well. Testing one, two, one, two. Party people, you know what to do. <laughs> Kyle, um, thanks for that, um, because I think Birth of a Nation is kind of a seminal moment in racist propaganda in this country. <clears throat> it's part of uh, a nascent um, industry called the film industry. It was successful. Um, we successfully protested it and created an industry uh, of our own, black film for black people. Um, and yes, it did, um, in fact, uh, create the explosion of the Klan and Klan-related activities uh, in this country. But moreover, it inspired a generation of folks to use uh, this, uh, this new art form uh, to educate and to liberate, to recognize the absolute importance of, uh, of film in this uh, movement. Uh, well, sorry. Uh, FaceTime coming in. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, it's uh, Harriet Tubman. Sorry. Hi, Harriet. I'm amongst friends. Don't worry. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, the difference between us is very great. Most of what you've done in the service of our cause has been in the night. I've worked in the daytime. The midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witnesses of your devotion to freedom and, and to your heroism. Listen, Harriet, Harriet, listen, listen. She's, you know, she likes to talk. Um, I know of no one who has risked more, who has sacrificed more to serve our enslaved people than you have. Most of what you have done would seem improbable to those who don't know you like we know you as the conductor general on the Underground Railroad. Get on board, little children. Come on, y'all. Get on board. Sing to her. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for many or more. Come on, y'all. Get on board. Little children, get on board. Clap. Come on. Little children, get on board. Little children, there's room for many or more. Good night, Harriet. Say good night, Harriet. 
Harriet, we love you. Thank you. That's dope. Thank you so much. Janaya, did you want to respond to the to the question about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Only to say that um, you know, I think that moment, like Birth of a Nation, really dispelled the myth that um, you know that you know art imitates life. Um, and actually, like life imitates art. That is the impact of propaganda. That is, you know, these niche beliefs can become mainstream very easily. Um, all it takes is the right match or the right narrative and the right moment. And you know, um, I think that I I didn't understand a few years ago the significance of this particular film. Um, in the American zeitgeist and how we're still living in the long shadow it cast. For sure, without a doubt. Thank you. I wanted to get into a fun question. <laughs> I want to ask the panelists, when you think of civil rights on film, which film comes to mind? And do you have any suggestions for what our audience should see? Justice? Or? Well, I'm... Um, I'm going to pick a film that I recently saw that comes to mind because if I just pick the, um, and maybe this is, by the way, I don't know if this, this has to be within regeneration, correct? No, Anything that comes to okay, mind. Great. Um, well, I've been watching a lot of uh, films that uh, tell civil rights films within the new era. And I recently just saw the Till movie and I saw Roger in it. Um, and, uh, Right now, that film comes to mind because on one part, uh, that film was about the loss of a son, but it was also about the exploitation of black violence, in which we're literally, we're, we're still in the era of that, uh, and how we show and depict violence of black people uh, losing their lives. And so I think a lot of that makes me reflect on the civil rights era that will follow what happened with Emmett Till because then you were seeing people march and then that was all showing up on the news, um, which again is still happening to this day. Um, and then something that happened in the movie that really kind of hit me uh, down the line, especially now, is we used to force, or at least Emmett, Emmett Till's mother wanted people to see her son, to acknowledge it, um, that it happened and now when we look at the images of violence, we can't look because we've seen so much. And I think it's really interesting um, if you think about it, how much time has passed and how many lives we have lost, right? But now instead of seeing like, oh, we need, we need to see it, we're actually in a place where we're just, we're really trying to stop the sight of it. And I know? think that also speaks to the, you know, how the modes of communication have changed so drastically mm -hmm. that you have to now veto out of mm -hmm. imagery like this. Yeah. And then the role of film in that moment also, you know, yeah. kind of shifts. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, uh, the spook sat by the door. Yeah. yeah, that one is, um, I think speculative fiction is part of what it means to be black. Um, there's a Western obsession with this nihilistic, you know, post-apocalyptic kind of world and this idea that it's coming. And for black and African and indigenous people and the ways that we overlap, we are living in a post-apocalyptic re reality um, right now in the aftermath of colonialism and what, you know, Hartman calls the afterlives of slavery. Um, and when I think of that particular film, um, you know, it's fantastic, it's critical of this moment, and it's informed by a, ro a robust politic on, huh, well, well, what the hooks would call the imperialist white supremacist capitalist Christian heteropatriarchy. <laughs> something, something small like that. Of course. But, you know, um, I think, you know, when, uh, you know, Octavia Butler's work striking a chord right now, and of course we're seeing some efforts at bringing it onto the screen is vital. Um, it's essential, um, but it, it's, it's captivating our attention in this moment because it comes from, not just because it's well-written, um, but because it comes from this 
African and black feminist belief in something beyond resistance. Like it's, a, it's, it's the introduction of a new belief system. And that is actually what we're up against. We're not up against a set of, you know, Congress people or a specific administration. It's an actual belief system. And the question in her work and the question for us is what is our belief system to counter the one that we're in? Because what we're exceptional at is coming together against the thing. And I love that about us. I mean, we ride hard. But what are we, we, we struggle when it comes to what we are moving towards. Um, what is it that we are aligned in? What are our non-negotiables? You know, um, I had an evening um, once with the Nation of Islam and uh, they ended up being my security detail. And for those of you who don't know, this, this it's a very rich history, but uh, I'll, I'll redu unfortunately I'll reduce it in, the, in light of time and in respect to you know, my peers. Um, but just know that the Vesalian part is that they do exceptional work in black communities and have for many years, and they're very flawed in lots of ways, and they're so much more than beautiful black men who are yelling at you on the corner with in a megaphone and with you know, a newspaper in hand. Um, they recruit black men specifically out of prison and offer them jobs and family and faith, and some of that, uh, so much of that is around security. And they have a history of being very homophobic and very transphobic, and I am a raging homosexual <laughs> with a gender identity at the time that was, was very much like Battlestar Galactica. It was, yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> I was pretty hot, it's true. But the point is that, you know, here we are and we, you know, we have these narratives of each other and these limitations um, on our interaction. But over the course of the evening when they were, I mean, their security was exceptional, but we had this exchange and we ended up having fun and laughing and flirting and all these amazing things. Flirting is essential. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that we had a non-negotiable and they didn't need to know my pronoun and I didn't need to know everything about the interactions that happen behind the walls of you know, the, the institution, although Fruit of Islam is pretty gay, if you ask me, in terms of a name. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, they, our non-negotiable was that they believed my life was worth protecting and I believe that their lives were worth protecting and for that night, that was enough. And that's... Yeah. That is the, the scaffold, the, sorry, the foundation of a belief system. That's the heart of it all, yes. <laughs> I, can I just add something? I, I want to ask Kyle, um, what are some films, to, to, follow, to follow up the question, what are some films that you think the audience should see, and what, do you, what comes to mind when you think of civil rights? I'm going to echo uh, the reference to Spook Who Sat By The Door, but sure. somewhat for, for personal reasons. Um, the, the story itself, is certainly um, a civil rights themed story. It really is about um, the community rising up and, and manifesting its own destiny and taking control for its its destiny. Um, but the filmmaker, Ivan Dixon, was a very, very dear friend of mine. And uh, <clears throat> he shared with me the arduous tale of how he was able to get that film made. I don't know if we have the time to get into all the details, but um, he had made a promise to himself that he was not going to participate in the black exploitation era of filmmaking, except that John Johnson um, of Ebony Magazine and Barry Gordy said to him that since all of his credits up to that point were uh, as a television director, um, that he needed to prove that he could direct a feature film. And so we went off and directed the film um, uh, Trouble Man, starring Robert Hooks. Most of you probably know it for the theme song. Um, and proved the point. And then they reneged on their promise to fund Spook. And so he went on WLIB radio, talk radio station, AM radio station in New York City, and in five and 10 $7 increments, was able to get listeners to start contributing to a fund to get this movie made. Um, and after he had maybe three quarters of the budget he needed, he just started shooting. Um, and then he had his editor cut together 
just the action scenes and put together a sizzle reel and took it to United Artists, which was owned by Transamerica Insurance at the time, showed them this reel of action scenes and they thought it was going to be another black exploitation movie. And so they backed it. Um, they gave him the completion funds. He reshot a lot of stuff, got the film in the can. And then when the film was released, the Symbionese Liberation Army snatched Patty Hearst. A train of munitions derailed in South Central, and the, the, the burgeoning groups known now as the Crips and the Bloods raided the trains and got those guns. And so people started to associate th these activities happening with the film, as if the film inspired these, these things. And so United Artists took their logo off the film, and cinema operators decided to stop showing it. Um, so it is a wonderful film. The story is incredible. You should see the film for its own merit. But the story behind how the film was made has always inspired me. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's a history of activism within, you know, the, the creation of black film. That's right. Mm -hmm. And does anyone want to speak to that process? Okay, well, I'm gonna say something about it. Okay. Um, okay, well, let me first say a couple of things that will help in the storytelling. Um, my dad, obviously, is John Singleton, and I grew up very much with the lens of watching him get his films off the ground. Um, and for those who don't know, getting your average film, whether you're black, whether you're white, sometimes is arduously hard, but for, especially if you're a black man, um, especially if you're part of what I would say would be the second or third generation of black filmmakers. Um, within that time, I feel like my dad did everything he needed to do to get his first film made. He went to school, and I mean community college, and then he did college, and he met all the people. He did his first film, nominated for Academy Award. I'm fast forwarding time, but basically, but up until that point, I'd say like the mid 90s, I was actually conscious for the struggle of what he went through, which, let me be honest, caused a lot of trauma for my own filmmaking because I was just like, it gave him headaches and unfortunately a lot of other health problems. Filmmaking is in, uh, I think, a process for a person where you are defining yourself and your place within the world, but then as the industry, you're, just, you're kind of finding your worth, your sense of worth and respect. And so I look at that differently um, now that I am an adult, um, I kind of held myself to a promise. I worked in a lot of film and TV, everything from PA to writers, all this stuff, and I realized um, there's some sort of manifest destiny, which was like, how can I do the most work um, within a community? So I like to make community films. Um, and a lot of my shorts are with people who are I've either met off the streets or just people that I'm friends with, right? But then I made an extra promise, which is, in activism, what is the thing that we're missing, which I think is the storytelling aspect. People are so, all the things that we go through as people of color um, in our day-to-day -day lives make it really hard for us to find private, intimate moments to tell our stories. Um, you used to have it um, where you go to your grandma's house. I mean, people still have this now, but you know, generations ago, grandmas telling each other their stories and you know, learning each other, you'd have like women who are the real original storytellers of our history. Um, and now you have our phones, but something's still missing. There's a grasp in which we're fighting against ourselves because they've taught us that. Um, so my duty now, not just as a filmmaker, but as an educator, is to teach people how to unlearn the history that really, I think, promotes you to do it what they call the right way, which is the white way. Um, and to do it your way. Um, and that, I think, is what the next generation will learn, is they'll actually unlearn a lot more. Remember how you're saying how film and history, um, life imitates art? We're learning that again, but we're learning that our life can imitate that art, not the life they want us to have, um, which I think is now where I'm, I'm fighting against being like, get out your own way, like, you know, write your story, because that's what my dad taught me. Beautiful, thank you so much, thank you. Roger, I wanna take a moment for you to respond to this. For the moment, 
my son, Louis H. Douglas. Represents our whole people. Rising up from degradation to respectability and from proscription to equal rights. The principle involved is one for which every man and every woman ought to contest, for it involves the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it is the business of every American citizen, black and white. Now, my son Lewis had just returned home from the war. He had stood on the walls of Fort Wagner, South Carolina, borne himself like a man on the perilous edge of battle. And now that the war was nearly over, Lewis returned home, somewhat broken in health, but still willing, still able to work at his trade. But alas, he begged in vain of his fellow worms to give him leave to toil. Day after day and week after week and month after month, Lewis sought work. He found none and he came home sad and dejected. You know, for 16 years I had published a public journal in Rochester, New York. I had employed white men, white apprentices during all this time. I paid out to white men in Rochester, New York, at least $100,000. And yet here was my son, a young man of good character, who learned his trade in my office, a Civil War veteran. and yet unable to find work at his trade because of his color and his phrase. You know, walking among my fellow citizens out there in the street, I have never failed to receive my due courtesy and kindness. In fact, there are even some men out there who have shown an interest in saving my soul. But of what avail are such manifestations where one sees himself ostracized and degraded and denied the means of obtaining his daily bread? Frederick Douglass. Thank you. I don't know if that was a response or not. <laughs> we felt it anyway. <laughs> this is brilliant. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is brilliant. <laughs> you guys really don't understand. I'm sorry. I, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I want to talk about the 1980s. The black independent film movement of the 1980s that birth what some called the new black wave is a direct callback to the pioneers in the regeneration exhibition. How does the activism and work of these black film pioneers shape black film's future? Um, on the heels of what we just heard from Frederick Douglass, um, <clears throat> I know you've asked about the 80s, I'm gonna get to it. But I think it's important to, to note that Frederick Douglass was the most photographed individual in the 1900s, uh, 1800s, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> 19th century. Um, and that was a very intentional and deliberate choice on his part. Media at that time, of course, was limited to print and the, uh, most of our populace was illiterate, and so a lot of the information that was conveyed in print was done through cartoon. And black folk, once again, were grotesquely depicted in cartoon. And so 
Douglas decided to counterbalance that with an image of self that was filled with integrity and purpose and constitution. Um, <clears throat> and, and as I said, he was the most photographed person during his day. So now the bridge to your question about the 80s, I feel that the filmmakers of the 80s felt this urge to reset the narrative, mm -hmm. um, largely driven by this new reference called hip hop. Um, just a demand to be seen based on one's definition of self, not to have their, their identity imposed upon them. And so the filmmakers of that era, Roger being one, um, were very intentional about that. And I think we all benefit from their commitment. For sure. And especially after this comes after the Wiz effectively ended the uh, funding for black films from studios. So this era of, you know, r defining ourselves for ourselves and funding that definition. Why, why do you think that was? Why do you think The Wiz ended the, the funding from studios? Um, because The Wiz at that time was the most expensive musical. It had, into the studio's imagination, it had everything that black audiences would want. It had a Motown, it had the stars of the day, it had Diana Ross, it had Michael Jackson, it had everything, right? But in translating the whiz from the stage play to the film, it lost some of its essence of blackness. Absolutely. And in doing so, and also when we think about how the whiz was um, marketed in 1978, it also followed the marketing plans of this uh, energized uh, studio system after black exploitation, which was you know star heavy and didn't really capture the essence of what the movie was about. So and also the film the the where the film played, it wasn't in black communities. Yeah. So all of those ingredients together means that the Wiz was not a success. And instead of you know talking to the communities about why that could be, it just kind of became oh, well, they don't want this. They don't want this cinema, so we don't have to invest in it. Mm -hmm. But, yes. <laughs> well, and there's something really interesting about that aspect because if you look at, um, if we're going to go back to the 80s, a lot of them, like, let's just think about the UCLA students, the of Charles course. Burnett's. Like, there are so many independent films that were being done to present a personal culture. Um, and now when we think about mainstream black culture and how black movies are presented there, we're, we're kind of like in a, I'd say we're almost in the whiz, we're in the whiz complex, except for we have, you know, we have some studios like macro and we have like black owned places, but we're still in a very, like, it could be, it could be like black Panther, which is out right now. Everyone's seen it, but then there's, there's 10 black Panthers. There's 20 black Panthers. We haven't seen them yet. But they're out there, right? So there's kind of a thing of like, it feels like it's getting, it could be personal within a time where we want to reflect our environment, what we're socially and economically and culturally going through. But on the other fact, it's like, if we're not getting the stars and we're not getting the, to be honest, the really cool white boy executive who works with us, you know what I mean, it, right? Or it's just it's, it's it gets harder and that's how I feel as a new filmmaker which is you want to make the films that they were making in the 80s now and to be honest you can because there's a thousands and thousands of places but to get that audience and that community to see it you still feel like you need a star right? but I also think you know what distinguishes the 1980s is a lot of these were groundwork campaigns right yeah. so you know Spike carrying his film cans from place to place in the same way that the uh, the filmmakers from the 1940s, 1920s through the 1940s did. Yeah, yeah. They marketed in black press mm -hmm. to get their films out there. Yeah. So to have this callback to this movement that you know we still feel today and feel energized by the films of the 1980s, I think is just quite special. Yeah. Um. Uh, all to say, uh, I think in the 80s and 90s, sorry if I'm jumping the gun. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Just, I think there was a moment, well, 
we have moments every generation of reckoning with the limits of cultural presence and cultural presence doesn't equal systemic power and there's a way that you know we are black people and the narrative of blackness is is curated into spe into specific limitations set by studios set by the imagination set by you know these institutions these belief systems that we we're talking about and there's um and i i feel i i'm saying cuz i feel it right now where you know post this big movement moment um you know the the sorry i I'm, i haven't slept a lot lately but the um, the the ubiquitous ness of cameras uh, in all of our on our person on our literal person um and how we are seeing tiny videos films of police brutality of these moments of power of you know black women just owning and black trans people just owning a, a, a space um, and defending their communities we're just and the aftermath of that where now it's no longer on vogue to hire black people we're seeing black people who are pulled into big tech and, and hired on this whim of, the, of these this corporate sort of whirlwind of oh we got to capitalize on this moment um, and you know there's a there was an expansion and now it's a contraction and our and, but we're still here and our hopes and our dreams and our ideas and our creation is still here and the the moment i think of tension is the um the the illogic of racism the they the, are the you know this is fanon this is you know black facts or whatever but there's this it's that it's not something that is reasonable. We can't there we can't follow the thread of what the right formula is or what calculations we make so that we can be in charge of our own representation, in charge of our own self determination and sense of self, right? That's you know, that's the voice, you know. So it's we're just it's it's this tension um that we live within, but we but it doesn't ever stop us. It's it's the 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 paradoxical like living in contradiction right and, and seeming contradiction and it's why our art we know when something is black and when something isn't we, we can you can feel that and uh with this in this moment of contraction i just i want to see our real enthusiastic grassroots embrace of creation from black people, from black young people, from, you know, just from our, our folks, because I think that we're exhausted. I think that there was a lot of mutual aid moving on, and I think we can, it, we might make the mistake of thinking that art is frivolous, um, but it's essential. The commodification of film being at odds with the process of how black people create it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I do want to touch on something you said, and I think it's really important. The way that most people relate to civil rights in film today is through videos that peop, you know, people on the street take of the atrocities against black lives. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about you know, the black film canon, if you will, <laughs> you know, how do we what, what do you take away from these videos? Like, do you consider, and not do you consider these people filmmakers, but more of just how do you think this fits within the conversations of civil rights and black film? Um, I think it's, I think it, it, it deserves its own lane in it, but that is, it, that documentation is essential. We have always told our own stories and we've always told them best and they're, they're not always pretty. Um, I think that with time, because we're in a growth curve, you know, millennials, the millennial generation, which is the one I'm from, um, apologies to Gen Z, <laughs> is, you know, we were the, the, the world that we were prepared for bottomed out when we were about, you know, halfway through adolescence. And, you know, suddenly it was, you know, the, this promise, this new religion of big tech and everything else. And, um, and and the information age, right? Like that is that was the key that we are in the information age, and that we would be liberated and, you know, be in charge of our own stories and, you know, 
and and really black people have been the most exploited um, in terms of um, predation from um, you know predation surveillance um, ads that target uh, uh, you know certain people certain populations based on zip code that are either for good or ill um, you know we have been we're as per usual we are most vulnerable but we've also had the most creative free liberated relationship to the technology where we are it is you know i i sometimes feel like why white people and really just non-black people in general why they don't believe that the things that we say are real are in fact real because they say if it's as awful as you say and if racism and its legacies are as hideous as you say slavery how is it that you can be so this today how is it that you can be so powerful how is it that you can be so beautiful so proud i think that there's that that is a part of the disbelief and we live in that liminal world and we we it is it is only a matter of time before we take the tools that were meant made to oppress us you know and and use them but I'll, I'll, you know, to reference Lord, there are limitations to that use, but I'll, to circle back, because I can be long-winded, um, it's that what we're seeing in these fragments of, of documentaries will expand into full-blown um, full blown films. Yeah. It's uh, because that is what we do. Yes. That's what we do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Roger, I want to take a moment for you to respond to this as well. My previous response was, of course, inspired by the work of justice, which is in the tradition of John Singleton. The work of Lewis Douglas, of course, was in the tradition of his father, Frederick Douglas. The work of Sherry Sneed who is with us here is in the tradition of her father, Sherman Sneed. It's about family. Otto Frank might say to his daughter, Anne Frank, Tonight, I would like to gift to you this small checkered book, empty. Fill it. Fill it with your dream. and your nightmares, and by all means do try to live up to the meaning of your two given names, grace and God is my vow. And now, will I wish you the happiest of birthdays, my child. Lucky number 13. <laughs> you are a Gemini, star-crossed and stubborn, and the apple of your father's eye, even when he is blinded by this Teutonic rage tempered by a bourgeois civility. You know, I punched a man out in the camp, one of my closest comrades. I nearly took his life. I suppose you could call it an attempted fratricide, state-sanctioned. After the war, I sought him out. I wanted to apologize and effect a truce. Yo, comrade. 
My bad. Yes, that is your dad. Remember when we <laughs> slathered the walls of your little room with black and white photographs of Hollywood movie stars torn out of magazines? And also, curiously, the black and white photograph of a white man in blackface. Black Pete, the Christians call him. Zwat Piet, riding shotgun to jolly old Saint Nick. We are German, not Dutch. And I am a decorated World War I veteran, German, not Dutch. We cross the border, but the border will never cross us. Even with this stateless status, even as we are herded into the future unknown. And so tonight, our hearts are enjoined around this very small table. There are eight of us. That is infinity. But soon, there will be only one of us. And that is a tragedy. A play within a play. Wherein the players are here today and gone tomorrow and tomorrow and no tears, no sorrow. Quick note to self, there are many who have lost more and will continue to lose and this is the lesson of this hour. Miss Billie Holiday's Blues, The Strange Fruit, Getting Stranger. Thank you. I wanted turn it over to the audience for one question. <laughs> so if you have a question, you're, oh, yes, please. Oh, you want me? You want my film list? <laughs> <laughs> First, you got to go back to Sherman Smith's Bell and Howe, eight millimeters. That's my dad. He and my mom came to LA and were denied accommodations. They thought that they were a mixed couple because my mom was very light skinned. And they didn't know that my mom had black stamped on her birth certificate in Charleston, South Carolina. And they didn't know that my brown skin father was a brown skin attorney who made a living by suing places like that motel that denied them accommodations. And my parents sued successfully. And they took the settlement money and built their own motel about three blocks away and took their business away from them. And my father said, capitalism, son, that's the greatest revenge of all. So the film that I gotta recommend is the film that my father got with that Bell and Howe movie camera, that the one you crank, you know, eight millimeter, when the Palm View Motel opened corner 39th and Western Avenue. Ooh. Okay? That's, that's a film that I recommend. I don't know if it's on YouTube, but I'll get you a copy. I want to thank our panelists so much. Thank you for this en enriching conversation. I want to thank the audience for being right here with us. It's very important to have these kind of moments. I hope that our generation 
the summit has been fruitful for you all. There's so much left of the day. And yeah, I want to thank you all. Thank you so much. Woo!